SDC's issue zero, Sonic Yearbook 1982. So this is an unintuitive prologue to a Sonic comic, then, like the STC version of the Sonic miniseries. Glad I eventually found out about this, but it wasn't on my timeline for STC, so there's a reason I missed it. Sonic runs around to Marble Zone and gets some rings. So far, this is as generic Sonic as Sonic can get. Like any game purist would imagine the stories to be. Oh, I like that Eggman's catching a person in a trap inspired by Mousetrap. I guess he started watching some cartoons and got ideas for traps. But it was hard to tell that he was watching cartoons and not actual camera footage of him making a trap on people because the footage was all monochrome. And I'm already really annoyed by him talking in egg puns. I can barely figure out what he's saying because they're so annoying. He uses the paintbrush to paint a fake tunnel entrance in the wall of a marble zone. Oh, I like that. It's pretty charming. Why is he telling caterpillars to shoe when he should want them around? He even says in the very next panel that he wants them around so Sonic can spin dash them and then run into the wall. Now I'm guessing that Sonic will magically not run into the wall and will not fall for the trap. Because that's a predictable writing of not only this comic as a whole, but also of every Roadrunner cartoon. The villain always fails for some reason. And I'm guessing he's not going to be satisfying in any way. Sonic thinks it was stilted dialogue just to give exposition to the audience about stuff he already knows, and when he liberates someone, a bullshit deus ex machina happens, as while well, he can go through the fake tunnel like it's a real one, Eggman can't, and it doesn't look like he's been dashed through a wall to get through it that way. Maybe he did, but it doesn't seem that way. That's not a satisfying victory for the heroes. What is it with early Sonic and wanting to just rip off the Roadrunner cartoons? First AOSDH and now this. Sonic's better off being more original. Though this is kind of charming. It makes no sense for this to happen at all. It's just as Gary Stu power saving him. Eggman puts some rings in the air to make them float and he pulls a rope with a giant magnet at the end of it to wait. Does Sonic have any metal on him? How does he expect that magnet to affect him? Oh, the rings. It's weird because rings look like they're made of gold, not iron. Can gold be affected by magnets? While Sonic says he's noticing something weird about his rings, which somehow are still solid instead of being absorbed into his aura by now, rather than Sonic being sent to the magnet by the rings, Eggman says that Egomatic's on the move because it's magnetized too. And I'm left to just assume... Sonic let go of the rings when he heard Eggman's commotion. You know, while it is nice to see Eggman being really active as a villain, it's also just making it look like it's just an issue dedicated to humiliating him as a character. I'm so glad that SCC learned its lesson from this and treated this character with respect and dignity, especially later on. Eggman puts some glue around the grass that just looks like syrup instead. I'm guessing this will fail too, but what's keeping me engaged, and I guess what keeps me engaged in Roadrunner cartoons as well, is that you never know how exactly the hero is going to bullshit Deus Ex Machina to avoid being infected by the trap. That part, at least, is unpredictable because it's so unintuitive what exactly will happen. Although I should have seen the Eggmobile part coming, but I guess I just assumed a genius like Eggman wouldn't have had it so close to a magnet. Eggman says that Sonic will be stuck here while a fountain of hot lava goes over him. Out of complete nowhere, one of the animals he's freed tells him to watch out for the glue because it's a trap. But instead of letting the animal be a useful character and having the badniks he fought be a Chekhov's gun because they heard what Eggman said, instead Sonic is apparently so awesome that he's moving so fast that the glue doesn't have time to stick. Huh? I wish I knew if that was scientifically accurate, because come on! And Eggman gets stuck in the glue. And some lava comes down on him and merely burns him. How'd that not kill him? This is why Eggman should be an android. If this was Robo Robotnik, I would have understood him surviving just fine. Because he would have slapstick against him and not create giant plot holes. That was completely ridiculous. In the next story, in Springyard Zone, so I guess this is the Sonic 1 adaptation I missed out on in SDC, 
Sonic generically beats Bad Ducks as usual, and then we see Eggman working on his Eggmobile, speaking in techno babble to give it a turbo boost, which is misspelled for some reason. Predictably, he makes the Eggmobile faster than Sonic. I'm guessing Sonic will be fine, though. Well, I think the art looks nice, at least. Finally, after some pointless padding, Eggman shows up to Sonic, and Sonic just tries to run away instead of jumping at him and attacking him. He stops and finally lampshades his nicest swim, only to miss his attack because of the Eggmobile's turbo thrusters. Sonic runs down the U-shaped slopes that were iconic to Spring Out Zone, and that makes Eggman wonder where he went as Sonic's standing behind him. I love this! See, this is how you properly take advantage of a game level in a story. Don't just have Sonic fight badniks. Actually use the level design. That's impressive. This is the only level in Sonic 1 that has those U-shaped slopes. So yeah, this is a way to use Spring Out Zone correctly as a setting. Sure, other levels in Sonic also have those slopes. And something way more iconic to Spring Yard Zone were those slow-moving blocks. But at least this is something. At least here I feel like something in the plot only happened because of the exact setting they're in. It's not like with a lot of other times in the comic where it doesn't matter where they're in. They're just fighting badniks anyways. Like, like Emerald Hill Zone could be called Not Hole, and I think that aside from it having loop-de-loops, the plots in it would be exactly the same and make exactly as much sense. Sonic was about to sneak up behind Eggman, but he reveals himself by bragging about his speed to him anyways, so no wonder Eggman noticed him, even if he didn't attack him. Sonic runs in front of him, once again not attacking Eggman directly like he really should. So what was the point of him getting behind him just for him to not do anything? Eggman then turns the speed in his Eggmobile up to Psychotic, making me assume that it's gonna backfire on him. If he thinks this is a good idea, then why did he wait so long to turn it up to Psychotic anyways? Also, he should know that if he goes too fast, and he misses, not only would he risk crashing into the wall, but he'd fly right past Sonic. I guess he's hoping to crash into Sonic and kill him though. But Sonic obviously would have rings by this point, so he's invincible anyways. Sonic runs around his Eggmobile, reminding us that he already said he could do that, and spins the Eggmobile around, so apparently even on Psychotic mode, the Eggmobile can't crash into him. Bullshit! This isn't satisfying at all! There's no way this would happen! Sonic just feels like a creator's pet here, again! I feel like they toned down that problem with him as time went on, and it's especially obvious going back to the earliest issues. Eggman should be faster than him here. At least the comic isn't being predictable for a change, but that's only because it's being unintuitive. Oh, now he goes fast! I thought he put his Eggmobile on Psychotic earlier. What took him so long? I don't care about Shinobi, so seeing this was a huge disappointment. So I'm ignoring it. Human character Ninja runs around. The end. We cut back to Sonic eating bonbons instead of chili dogs for once. I love that about SCC. Just as I was wondering in annoyance if I'd ever see the title, Sonic actually lampshades this and we get to see it after all. I can totally forgive him breaking the fourth wall here because it's really early on and he's doing it while he's completely alone, so it's not totally immersion breaking making me ask why his friends aren't questioning this. He says he can't see a friendly face, making me wonder if he promptly would, and he technically does by freeing a bird, who tells him that there's a whole bunch of birds imprisoned in a metal tank at the edge of the zone. He stops just before, oh never mind, he does run off the cliff, just like in issue 1. Again, he should be able to stop faster than that. He, he hits a spring, and I desperately wait for something original to happen that I haven't seen a million times before since I play Sonic games too. He hits a robot maker and it blows up, and Eggman threatens him with his spike ball eggmobile, because we can't have to be too creative. And even then, I was just thinking that the blowing up robot maker was also not creative because it happens in Sonic 3 as well, although it probably predates it. Thank goodness Tails shows up to make things more interesting. He jumps onto his Eggmobile from behind, unfortunately revealing himself by talking instead of doing so by just punching him. I'm guessing that because this is early Fleetway Tails and all its idiocy, he'll just get humiliated and kidnapped instead of being helpful to Sonic by constantly punching Eggman and distracting him for Sonic, even though he can fly out the Eggmobile just fine. Maybe it'll close a dome over itself to trap him, or he'll get smacked away. 
At least he has the time to chat with Sonic and run along with them, because disappointingly, Tails doesn't stay in the Eggmobile and punch Eggman for some reason. Even though he'd be a lot more helpful that way. That wasn't foreshadowed. But at least it's surprising instead of predictable as usual. We see an explosion and a hammer behind Tails for some reason. Just for us to cut to more panels of Eggman threatening Sonic with the Sonic 1 first boss. So what was that about? Sonic actually vanishes after spinning around in a spin dash. I hope that he simply drilled into the ground and didn't actually vanish. Then I remember what the title of the story made me suspected of. Because Sonic just stays still and the spike ball smashes- Oh good! A cardboard cutout! Not actually an after image of Sonic that somehow would stay still standing there instead of looking like it's running. So that's good. It's better than it could have been. Sonic just ran off screen and replaced himself with a cardboard cutout, which he was prepared enough to make in advance. Makes sense that he'd think to do this because it's such an obvious good idea. I hate that he says he just made it, but I guess he made it that fast because he's fast in everything. I guess he has cardboard and paint at home and he ran home to get it. Eggman leaves, we see a locked cabin, and Sonic runs around the cabin in a circle, which magically breaks it apart just from doing that. When it would have made more sense for him to just, you know, just spin dash through it since it's made of mere wood. What the hell was Eggman thinking? Wood? I guess he was really strapped for time and materials because he should have just made it out of metal. Okay, I have no idea who wrote these stories since they went uncredited. I had to look up a wiki to find out. Scriptwriter Alan McKinsey. Okay. And the wiki says that these stories aren't directly related to SDC. So I guess that means they're non-canon, as much as that even matters with their light-hearted, one-shot nature. And the wiki tells me that there's another yearbook like this, but it's not on YouTube or Google. So whatever, I guess we'll never be able to read it. These stories were some light-hearted fun, so I don't want to hate them. But they can basically just be summarized as Sonic's a Gary Stew. He never makes any mistakes, other than... Well, he did run off a cliff, but who cares? He never- he doesn't make much- he doesn't make much mistakes. He never has any flaws. He just humiliates Eggman over and over again in ridiculous Deus Ex Machinas. At least he doesn't wear stupid disguises over and over. At least it could have been a lot worse, but the stories definitely could have been written more naturally. How is Sonic able to effortlessly jump through a fake tunnel while Eggman can't? How did Eggman survive lava? Why didn't Tails just stay in the Eggmobile punching Eggman to distract him so Sonic could beat him easier? Why would Eggman ever make a cabin out of wood when he's trying to lock people up in it, just for Sonic to make it collapse by merely running around it? I at least love that Sonic hid himself from Eggman with the U-shaped slopes of Springyard Zone, but it led to nothing because he just stupidly revealed himself to Eggman by talking, instead of surprise attacking him. So what was the point then? How did Eggman not effortlessly crash into Sonic when his Eggmobile was not only faster than him, but also at psychotic speed. These stories weren't written well at all. Sure, they had charm, but they were nothing but Sonic having Deus Ex Machina and winning way too easily while Eggman was on the bottom rung. Don't we see that enough in the modern Sonic games? Because he hasn't become an evil dictator yet, it's not satisfying giving him the karma he seriously deserves. Instead, this is just way too close to the games. Like, Sonic beating Badniks and gathering rings was way too much of- There was way too much of this. Stories like this are a game purist dream. I was really bored seeing Sonic deal with the first boss of Sonic 1. And it didn't even do anything new, like shooting lasers at Sonic. I'm glad I got a chance to read these. Feels like old times getting to review Fleetway for the first time again. But this is just a reminder of how far SEC has come since then, because, that's, because it's not trapped in games imitating Sonic the Gary Stu limbo. Nowadays, it's gotten way more unique with Amy and Techno. And tons of creative stories that don't have to have Robotnik in them.